Good morning, everyone. Thank you for reading us so beautifully. Our reading is this morning is from Ephesians and it's chapter four. Ephesians chapter four. And it begins this morning at verse 11. Father, we have really enjoyed reflecting on our own queen and then going from her as it were back to you and saying you are everything to us. We worship you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, the totally faithful one, the all-powerful one, the one full of grace and love, the saviour of the world. And we thank you that you have given us your word. As we read it, Father, we want to listen for your voice. We've been just reminded, Father, of our need to be alert to whatever you may say and eager to follow that through. We are very grateful that you have given us to that end your Holy Spirit and in each other too, so that we might follow you. Speak to us, Lord, for we are listening. Amen. So picking up Paul's writing at verse 11, chapter 4, Ephesians, it was he, that is Jesus, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Well, we couldn't have a greater contrast in the world at the moment, could we? When we have Putin, flexing his muscles at one side of the globe and affecting so many lives, and our queen on the other side celebrating 70 years of power of a totally different sort, but nonetheless affecting so many people throughout the world. Rather than the love of power, she speaks of the power of love. Endless people have associated the words soft and power when they speak of her. Hers is a soft power, the power of love, the matter. And as I look at passages in scripture and struggle to understand them, I'm often looking for a thread that will help me understand them. Here in this passage, Paul writes about the body of Christ being built up, growing up and all that, which put me in mind for the bookends of the Bible. Genesis 1 opens up with a husband and wife, or Genesis 1 and 2, husband and wife in a garden with God. And Revelation 21 and 22 end up with a bride and a bridegroom in a new creation with God. And so it seems to me not just an illustrated, a helpful illustration that Paul is plucking one out of the air, a body, I think he had a purpose in here. In the beginning, God gave the world he had made in charge of this couple to look after it. It never was theirs. It was always God's. But their task was to care for it. We often use the word steward. It's not a biblical word. More care for it, look after it, and help it to thrive and to come to flourishing and fruitfulness. They and their descendants had that task. Unfortunately, as we well know, they opted to go alone with disastrous consequences. So when God put into plan practice the plan he had already 
in mind before he created anything. He chose another man and a woman, this time Abraham and Sarah, and at their age with no children, an unlikely couple. And instead of putting them as he were on the whole earth, he chose a parcel of land and said, I give you this land. I want you and your descendants to live in this land, to look after it, to help it flourish and thrive and become fruitful and to watch over each other and for your descendants to pass that on so that the whole world will see how my world is meant to work. Well, they had a go, but unfortunately the history of the Old Testament shows us that the Jewish nation was just as much part of the problem as all the other nations. So then we come down to one man who never married, but who fulfilled the story of the Jews, God in Jesus, the man who is fully God and fully human. He showed us two profound things among all the other things. The first thing he showed us was what God was like. If our view of God does not include Jesus, it is not authentic to scripture. He says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He is everything. But he also shows what it is to be truly human. And as you look at his life in the Gospels, he came to a world that was in utter chaos, depending on where you were in the world. If you were a Jew, you were under oppression, as was a large part of the population of the world, under one oppressive regime or another. But he didn't come to exercise the almighty power of God in a way that we might have expected. He didn't come with a love of power, but he came with the power of love. And in his quiet, gentle, direct, confident way, he profoundly affected everything, not only in that little place we call the promised land, but as a result of that, in the entire world. He's shown us what one man full of God can accomplish when one man is utterly devoted to God. And shows us actually that the way God changes the world is not by works of incredible power, though God is perfectly at liberty and has done in the past to do extraordinary things but often through the ordinary people. So when Paul uses this terminology of the body, he's talking about a man. If you go back to chapter 2, you'll find that in verse 14, verse 14 and 15, 15, his purpose, speaking about Jesus in coming to earth, his purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, a single identity, the man Adam and his wife Eve, the man Abraham and his wife Sarah and their descendants, the man Jesus, and now we have the new man as opposed to the old man. And this time not limited to one geographic area because Jesus has already spoken to this one man and said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So we have a singular name for an entity. We are the one man, if you like, God has given this task of caring for his world, helping it to flourish and be fruitful, looking after it on his behalf and bringing his blessing. Of course, the ultimate blessing is Christ himself. If we have him, we have everything. So it's no wonder that we can say we have been blessed in every, what does he say? who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He is the ultimate blessing. So as we look at each week we face, with everything going on around us of huge import, making people wrestle with things, we might think our lives are pretty small and maybe even insignificant. But the life of our queen, 
demonstrates that even when you are given a place of prominence, it is by your godliness and your righteousness and your uprightness and your faithfulness that you accomplish things and not by the sheer will of intellect or power or brute force. So, of course, if you take this picture of one man, what Paul is saying here is that Jesus has created out of all the people, Gentile and Jew, in this one new man, all those who come to the Father through him, made them in one man. Of course, you've got a new man. And if we were to talk about a new man, we would talk about a child, wouldn't we? In fact, a baby. This new man has not done it before. So you're looking at baby, children, those of us who have children or grandchildren or have that experience of working with one children know that it's perfectly okay for babies to act in a baby kind of way and for children to act in a childish kind of way. But were you to grow to maturity and still be acting in a baby fashion, there would be something profoundly wrong. And there are hospitals for those kind of people. And if you were still acting in a childish way, you would almost be a mockery of what it is to be mature. So Paul is here saying this new man has to grow up to maturity so that we might become the people of God. Come on in. That was well timed. You were right on schedule. We have to grow up to maturity, which is what this passage is all about. He's speaking to people for whom Christianity is a fairly new thing, and he wants them to understand their responsibility. So he wants them to grow up. And it's not, you don't just tell a baby, grow up. You don't just tell a child, grow up. You help them grow up to maturity. Parenting is all about helping babies move to childhood, move to adolescence, and into maturity. Grandparent is helping that case. Neighborliness is helping that process too. So Paul says here that we've not been left on our own, but we've been given help. Of course, the significant help that he gives us is himself in his spirit. He gives us all the help we could possibly need in a spiritual way, but he's also given us helpful people. And so we have this list of five ministries or four, depending on how you count them, but let's leave it at five, shall we? It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Their task is to prepare God's people, that's all of us, for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. So the task of these people is not to do the work of the ministry. And I here he understand, I think, for the sake of a little comma, misplaced by an ancient version of English Bibles, rendered endless congregations useless, because it said in those versions, these people were to prepare God's people, comma, for works of service, comma separating the works of service from the people, putting them back with the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So it looked as if these gifted people were to do the work of service while all the other people just got prepared. For what? Who knows? And you've had endless congregations who basically have been buses with one or two people running around taking the tickets and preaching and all the rest enjoying the ride. But we know that isn't the case, and it certainly isn't the case here where we all recognize our responsibility as a people of God. So these people have been given in order to help us to grow up to maturity. So the only person who's always, who has already been these, all these five is, of course, Jesus himself. He is the five-fold man. He was the apostle. An apostle is someone who is sent. That's what it means, a sent one. And Jesus would say to his apostles after his resurrection, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Jesus is the sent one, the one prepared to go anywhere 
to do anything that his father wanted him to do. That's what apostles are. We'll come back to that in a moment. So the new man, this body of Christ, must have an attitude of being willing to do anything and go anywhere that God may determine. That can mean far off and far wide. I have three sisters, and one of them spent a lot of years in Africa because she felt that was where God had sent her. Another sister has spent most of her life living in one place because that's where God has called her. The physical geography is of less importance than the willingness to go anywhere to do what God calls us to do. It has a looking outward way. And you demonstrate this in all sorts of ways, not least in which your first Sunday of the month, it takes the gospel as it were and plants it in the village in the center there and gives people an opportunity to come and look. You're going out. So the apostle, Jesus is the one who has come at the behest of his father to do his will. He's the prophet. He not only brings the word of God, we're told he is the word of God. And the word of God is crucial to those who want to do God's will. To hear and receive God's word. As James says, not just to hear and receive, but to do it as much as we can. So we're those people. The new man is a person who's willing to do whatever his father wants him to do. Whatever it may involve. And the new man is one who listens to, eagerly to, the word of God above all others. He exalts God's word and God's name above all other things. Jesus was the evangelist who came to bring good news. We've had those words quoted for us this morning. I've come to bring good news for those who are in struggles. And so in the end, we must remember that the news we bring, we don't have to apologize for it because it is good news for those in dire situations. And in times of pressure, people can understand more clearly how good that news is. Pastors, that only appears in one place, and that's here. But the concept of pastor is, of course, shepherd, which appears right through the scripture in both the old and the new. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his down, down his life for his sheep. So he comes as the one who's prepared to do whatever's necessary that the sheep might flourish. And then, of course, he was the teacher par excellence. Nicodemus came to him and said, you are a teacher sent from God. And everyone was amazed at the way he taught, not as the scribes and Pharisees, but as one who taught from God. So we are to teach the whole counsel of God. So if the church, if the body, if you and I, if this new man is to be like Christ, which is a definition of maturity, then we are to be like him in every way. So are, who are those apostles? Some people think that if, I, if we were to look at everybody, you are one of those five. Some people will say every one of us is one of those five. That may well be true. And it doesn't matter whether it is or isn't true, because those five are meant to be in every congregation and into every place. Every church should have those five different ministries. And sometimes you choose particular ones for particular roles. This is where wording can get confusing, because often churches that are looking for leadership, for example, of a formal kind, will say we want to appoint a pastor. They're using the word from here. That pastor's task is to be a shepherd, to lay down his life for his friends. His task is to care for the sheep. So when he comes or she comes with these pastoral gifts and then disappoints the congregation who are looking for someone who would be a wonderful evangelist and will be prophetic in their teaching, but he's not, she's not able to do that, but they're brilliant pastors, they get disappointed because the person isn't what they ask. So we have to be careful in the use of words. Leadership roles in the New Testament are performed by elders. That's the term. Not these five. These five are specific things. So I wonder where you fit in this. As I go through these lessons, all I'm going to give is some, give some examples from the scripture. I wonder what 
resonates with you. The unique of examples of apostle, of course, are Jesus is the apostle of God. Then you have the 12 apostles, that's the 11 plus Matthias, who are those who are witnesses of the resurrection, which includes Paul. So he's the 13th one out of order. He said like one unnaturally born. So he includes himself that he actually did witness the resurrection of Jesus on that vision on the road to Damascus. They are unique and irreplaceable. You can't replace any of those. But others in scripture were Barnabas, he's called an apostle, Andronicus and Junius. And Junius is a feminine word, meaning a woman in Romans 16. Titus and some other unnamed brothers in 2 Corinthians. James in Galatians. Epaphroditus in Philippians. Silas and Timothy in 1 Thessalonians. Now let's be clear about one thing. These were not people who only ever spoke the truth. One apostle called Paul will take another apostle called Peter to task because of his willful disobedience to the gospel by refusing to have table fellowship with Gentiles. So they're not always speaking the truth. But these are people who in some way or other help the church to look outward, to be outgoing, to be reaching out to the communities around in all sorts of ways. Some of you will have that heart, but each church needs that. Each church needs to look inward upon themselves, but be looking outward all the time. An image that was once given to me is if you can imagine one of those very wide arrows pointing to the loo or whatever it is, okay? That sort of arrow, at the forefront of the arrow would be the apostle. Then there are those, of course, what we're all apostles, because Jesus said to his disciples, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, he said to all his disciples, therefore, go and make disciples. We all have that calling upon our lives to go. But some, it seems, have a special giftedness to help the church fulfill that role. If that's you, that's your task. That's your gifting from Jesus. And the purpose of it is to prepare God's people for works of service. So they can do what needs to be done. Prophets. Prophets were those who shared with the apostles the forming of the foundation of the early church in the arrow. The apostle will be right at the front and the prophet will be just behind. Those who are at the forefront of church building and church planting. Those people just heard the word of God. Those people wanted to hear the word of God. Those people had a particular facility for hearing the word of God. It's not unusual for some of us to say, hear from God. I hardly ever hear from God. And others to say, well, from time to time I do. It's one of those things. They're not boasting. They're just saying, I really do feel I hear from God what he wants to say. And it's not as for me, but it's for the church. Agabus, you remember him from Acts 11? Came and warned the folk that there was going to be a famine in Jerusalem. He told, told them in Antioch. This wasn't just to give them information so they can stockpile their cupboards. It was in order that the church could do something about the famine. And the instant response of the church in Antioch was to take a collection for the church in Jerusalem so they could be prepared for the famine. The purpose of the word of God is not to build us up and puff us up, but to enable us to respond to the word of God. So there needs to be in every church a system whereby we regularly receive the word of God as it's given, already an opportunity today. And you have such easiness in your meeting that it would be an easy thing to say, someone say, as Paul did this morning, I can't get this out of my mind this week. Can I share it? And you'd say yes. But that's not enough. Is someone recording it, writing it down? Because you know it's like, by Wednesday, we'll have forgotten. We're like that, aren't we? Other things crowd in. 
So you need someone to say, let's write this down. We really believe. And then we can think this really is of God. And it can be brought up regularly that you can pray into it and say, what do we do now? And so forth. So it's not just about hearing, but it's recording that. Find some way of making sure you don't lose the word, but can hold on to it and digest it. There were prophets and teachers in the church at Antioch when they sent off Paul to do mission with Barnabas. They were together hearing and they heard from the Spirit because they heard the Spirit say, set apart for me Paul and Barnabas for the work I've given them to do. So it was just a prayer meeting, as far as you can tell. But things had already been happening. So as you get together, as you pray together, it's always worth listening to the kind of prayers people are praying because often people pray the sort of prayer that they're getting from God. And it's worth hearing those things and just registering so that they can be put together. Judas and Silas, we're told, were prophets in the church and they had the task of taking the decision of the Jerusalem elders and the Council of Jerusalem back to the churches to take that decision that's made. And of course, Agabus predicting problems for Paul in Jerusalem, he pops up again in Acts chapter one, not in order to stop Paul from doing what he was doing, but to say, Paul, you're gonna face trouble and we need to be standing with you in this for it. So they're receiving the word of God, the contemporary word of God for the contemporary church at this moment in time. Yet, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached, as a result of the spirit coming down and everyone speaking out the words, he said, included Joel's testimony, didn't he? In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit from all people. And he adds this line, and they will prophesy, which is not in the Joel prophecy, but he added it. Speaking about all God's people. So my friends, we all have this facility of hearing God's word and sharing it. And if you ever had that, as exactly like Paul did it this morning, you seem to say, I feel there may be something from God in this. Can I share it? Often it's useful to write it down. It stops you endlessly repeating things and going off tangent. And you can say, this is what I believe. It can't get out of my mind. It's just one of those funny things. It may but not be good, but let me share it. And it allows everyone else to say, we've some, we've, we've, we think there's something in this. It could well be of God. Or... Thank you, it's very helpful, but there doesn't seem to be anything from God here. That's fine. It doesn't matter, you haven't failed. We're just bringing the word of God. And in such an affirming, confirming group like you are, there's no difficulty about that. So let me encourage you. And some of you will have that facility in order to help the church be more prophetic, hearing God's word, staying on track. The task in the Old Testament of prophets was to draw the people back to the word of God. Don't forget, this is our calling. Please come back, reaffirming what God says. Evangelist is someone who has that ability, spiritual midwife, some people call them, to communicate the good news of the gospel in such a meaningful and convincing way that people are able to respond. Oh, now I know. I understand. That's really helpful. Examples would be Philip. And Timothy, Philip, as he walks along beside the chariot, explaining things to the Ethiopian eunuch, having that facility to take God's word and make it plain to a man who asked him a serious question. Timothy is a, an evangelist. And the disciples themselves, all the way through the book of Acts. Yet, of course, we're all called to speak out the truth about the one we love so much, Jesus of Nazareth. We're all evangelists to some extent or another, but some especially so. And then the pastor, this confusing term, give it a small p and think shepherd. Some of you, and this is where I guess many people find themselves, is one who assumes long-term responsibility for the well-being, spiritual well-being of a group of believers. That could be in a formal way because you are given a role to do that. So some people are called pastoral workers in their churches because they're given a specific role to look after or maybe a specific group of people. But other people have it informally. They just care for people. We have a dear friend of ours 
living locally who just overflows with pastoral care. She maintains her friendships with so many different people just because she loves to do it. No one's telling her to do it. No one's forcing that she just does it. And you'll know people like that too. And every church should have plenty of them, shouldn't they? People who just take an interest in other people, care for them, looking after them. So we're all to look after each other, bear each other's burdens, says Paul to the Galatians in chapter 6. But also some people have that particularly. And then the teacher, those who have a facility with God's word to study God's word, to elicit the truth from God's word, and to share that truth in helpful ways with other people. I'm indebted to those teachers who have invested in me through their books and through the sermons I have heard and the conferences I've been to. I'm indebted to them. For much of, much of what I know and understand, I'm indebted to those people who've taught me the word of God. And, we're able, and teachers are able to share and to see and to help others grasp the word of God in a way that helps them grow. Barnabas and Paul are those sort of people. Yet in some senses, we're all meant to teach each other. Fathers, mothers teaching their children, grandparents teaching their grandchildren, informally with neighbours and friends. A little gathering of guys at work or ladies at coffee time, spending their coffee time just reflecting over the word of God, teaching one another. But some people are given that task especially. The purpose of all those is not to give people badges and to boost them into particular roles. Their task is to be that, exercise that gift, to prepare God's people for the works of service. That will help them grow up and build up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Because what God has done, he has entrusted his world to us, his people. He's not taken it away from everybody else as well, but especially to this new man. He says, go into all the world and be my people. Care for my world. Care for the people. In exactly the same way as Jesus did when he was here on earth. You want the model of that? Always look to him. In other words, the church is doing wherever it is found the sort of things Jesus would be doing if he were physically here, with the same interests. You can see where his focus of attention was, what his desire was, and his effectiveness in everything. So that this week, as we now scatter even into more small groups, perhaps ones and twos, maybe even just on your own this week, we're scattering, we're still part of this one new man. His task is to look after God's world in the power of the Spirit with those gifted us. Go and take that gift you've got, because it's not just inward gifts, these are outward. In this one, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor and teacher are the ones who pick up the people who enter into the kingdom of God, look after them, teach them, that they may also be part of the impetus of the church. So that's what Paul's saying here. We've got to grow up to maturity. That is, as each part does its work, speaking the truth in love. So what I'm encouraging you to do is to talk to each other, especially if you have something to say to one another about where you feel people's giftedness is. Because often we're the, not the easiest people to recognize the giftedness in ourselves. I'd encourage you to talk at different times. Just point out something. You can do it in such a way, say, in such and such a way, what you do always blesses me. You always bless me in this particular way. It's always an encouragement. Let me do that. In order to encourage you to use the gifts that God has given you for the work of the ministry. Let me pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we want to live in your world as full human beings whose focus is on you. We want to be filled with your spirit and we want to live each day to the glory of the Father. 
We want to love the Father with all our hearts and to love our neighbours as ourselves. And we want to enable other people to know the blessing of God and to thrive and to flourish. So thank you for planting us here, that this is the place of our calling. Thank you for making us the people we are. And we ask as we go into this week, that being the people you have made us filled with the spirit of Christ, working with each other, we may see your kingdom come and your will be done in us and through us to the glory of God. Amen.